Yep, and then we'll start filling up the kettle. And uh, one thing that I've been doing too, I used to sparge uh, for two hours. Uh, my commercial breweries always taught me, you know, longer sparge, better extraction. Um, so we do two hour sparge, and then I started doing an hour and a half sparge, and then I started doing an hour and 20 minute sparge. Recently, I've been doing a 45 minute sparge, and no change in my efficiency whatsoever. Um, I don't know if you could scale that up to a big brewery and do it in 45 minutes just because of this volume difference. But on this size system, I shoot for about an hour. If it goes a little bit too fast, then, then it seems to be all right. But yeah, it just shaves a whole hour off my brew day that I really don't need. So, And uh, yeah, so I like that part of it. So we can fill up the kettle pretty quick. One thing I've always learned too from many years of brewing is to get heat on your kettle. Uh, once you get a good amount of liquid in there, that way you're not trying to heat up 140 degrees from. That's how you uh, shave another half yeah, hour out of your brew day. Is pretty much, it's boiling kettle. by the time it's filled. Um, sometimes I'll turn it off and let it fill the last inch or so, and then I turn it right back on and it's boiling. So these burners have some serious heat behind them too, so it doesn't take long. So yeah, we just went from 100. The mass was originally at 151. It dropped a little bit just because it's not an insulated uh, container, which makes sense. But it dropped to about 150, 46, and it went from 146 to 156 in about a minute. And we'll be at 170 here in another couple minutes. So, and you guys can't see it on camera, but the wart is like crystal clear already. So. And that's the great part about doing the mash out is that you're doing a recirculation of the wort at the same time you're heating the temperature up. Yeah, I never had the ability to do this before in my old system. I mean, I did, but I would have had to buy more equipment, so I never did it. Um, but as soon as I got this system, I started doing this mash out recirc, and I love it. Uh, I mean, the science behind grain is that you stop all enzymatic conversion, and it actually helps release the, grain, the sugar out of the grains better. Um, so I've noticed a big difference in efficiency doing it this way, and uh, I think I'm up, I calculate my recipe, recipes using about 85 percent efficiency. 85 percent, which you know most recipes you That's see online are about 70. Yeah. So we get quite, you know, and if I, if I factor in my total volume output that I get, that if the brew house efficiency goes down because I only save 15 gallons out of the 20 I make just because I I do it all in one tank instead of having corny can a half partial filled corny can and the bright tank um, so because you're using uh, Sankey kegs yeah because I'm using Sankey with. keg as my bright tank uh, that they designed for us which we can probably show you guys here in a little bit and um, so I just I just package 15 and a half gallons it makes it easy for me instead of having to have 15 in one and three gallons in another or so and with IPAs you always end up with less than what you go for just because the amount of hops you use definitely take away from uh, your you know, wort output. If you're making a stout or something with low hops, you can definitely get yeah. all 20 gallons. Well, when you're putting in uh, five pounds of hops in a yeah. 20-gallon batch, right? Yeah, I think that one thing I've been doing too is, is doing a lot less hops in the kettle. I'll do just enough hops to get the bitterness I want, and then I'll save all my additions to uh, the last like 10 minutes. I'll do an addition at 10 and an addition at zero. And then I'll save all my really strong aromatics for dry hopping. And I'll dry hop in the fermenter with about a day or two left of fermentation to help kind of distribute everything around, but not vigorous enough that it's going to blow all the aromatics out. Uh, sometimes I'll cap it and, and you know, capture some of that CO2. Um, but I've noticed that if I do that and then stick it in the cold room, you get a lot of uh, uh, suction. And if you try to take a sample, it actually sucks air up into the of the, I haven't figured out a way to, to get around that, but it doesn't nice. seem to cause any problems. I haven't gotten any contamination issues from it, but. Uh, Nitrogen bleeder valve, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Okay, great. Yeah, I need to get something. So yeah, we're at 166, so we're almost, almost ready. And then we'll switch over to the black hoses, <laughs> which you use on this pump. And uh, yeah. You know, we're almost halfway through the brew day already. I mean, it goes pretty quick. 
So we just started the recirc, and you're starting to pump out of the mash tun through the pump, through the coil that's in the hot liquor tank, now starting to heat up the mash and put it back up onto the top through the spar jar. Yeah, exactly. I have the hot liquor tank set at 190 degrees, and the mash was at 150 with the idea that the hotter, the, the hotter, the bigger the temperature difference in temperature, uh, the faster this thing is going to get up to 170 where I have the pump to shut off at. And uh, when I was a student at Oregon State, we did some research um, that showed at this point in time, with some of the larger breweries like Budweiser and Coors, they have brakes and stuff built into their mash tun, and they'll actually kick them on right at the beginning of sparging to kind of even out the bed. Uh, if not, you end up with little tiny ridges and stuff that water will choose the path of least resistance. And so you, if, uh, if you do a little bit of stirring of just the top like inch, it will help lay the grain bed down even and uh, will improve your extract by a little bit. I mean, a couple percent, but you know, every little bit counts. And, now, uh, now that's a little tip that you learned when you went to the Oregon State University Brewing School? Yeah, I, I, um, they're actually, their food science department is split between fermentation science and knowledge and, uh, and food science itself. And so I was a food science major with an option in fermentation. So I did about a year and a half of studying beer and about a year studying wine. And uh, I was the head brewer for their food and fermentation science club for about a year. We had an 80 gallon uh, system that was donated by Norwester Brewing, which is no longer uh, in business, but uh, it's a uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards owner, uh, I can't remember his name, but he donated the system to Oregon State in the ni in 99, I think. Beautiful okay. facility. Uh, Bridgeport does a lot of their research brews there, uh, along with uh, some other brewers that fly in and do their trials there instead of them having to buy their own pilot brew house, which they could buy one of these though, so. They could. <laughs> so yeah, and then I let this sit until it goes, uh, gets up to temp. It takes about five or so minutes for it to kind of start going up in temp, and then it goes real fast. And, uh, and then we'll start sparging. Perfect. And so one thing that I've learned is that, you know, you don't want to sparge with 190 degree water because you can kind of extract tannins and stuff from the grain. Um, so even though this is at 190, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a couple gallons out uh, and replace it with cold water and bring it down to 170 really quick. And then that way we're all at the same temp, so. So yeah, well we just, you know, I tell everyone about this system that you kind of just watch it do its thing. You just kind of sit here and man it. So uh, when I'm brewing by myself, you know, a lot of people will be like over there going, oh, they'll look through the window and see the hot liquor tank spurting water out. And they'll be like, something's happening. It's all right. It's all right. I know what's going on. <laughs> you got it under uh, control. Yeah, I just sit and work on my computer and, and just kind of like wheel my chair over <laughs> back and forth. So it's you're in here funny. for six hours, but you're not necessarily <laughs> brewing for six hours. You're yeah. doing other stuff, yeah, getting work done. And we do a lot of setup the night before. I'll mill in the night before, keep my grain in here so it's at room temp. Um, that way I can hit that 13, 14 degree drop in temperature pretty much every time. And, uh, and sometimes I'll even go ahead and hook up all these hoses. Uh, but today I did it just because I wanted to show you guys that. Um, but with all the preparation the night before and getting everything clean, then there's not really that much to do come brew day besides just kind of watch it. And how sure long is your average brew day? Five hours. Five hours. Yeah. So. But an easy five. Yeah, pretty easy five. Cleaning's always the hard part, um, but you know, you get people to help and it's all right. Great. Some days I'm stuck in here by myself and I have to do everything. And th those days are a little bit uh, longer than normal. Um, but I usually schedule massages on my brew days afterwards, believe it or not. What, so. a, what a luxury. <laughs> that, that comes as part of the, so your I've got one today contract. At, I've got one today at 4 o'clock, so. <laughs> Excellent. Works out pretty good. Yeah. I'm, I spoil myself, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, so, I mean, this thing's so well designed, especially with these temperature controls. Right now it's set for 170 degrees, so it's going to recirc until it hits 170, and then it's going to shut off. And with the hot liquor tank on temperature control too, I can leave to go to the bathroom or run upstairs to the, my printer's upstairs. So if I gotta leave the office, I don't have to worry about, is the flame, is it too hot, is it too cold or anything? It's just, I'll come in, it will be silent, I'll know it's done and uh, move on to the next step. So that's a, that's a great feature. I remember uh, my old brewing system, it was like you were glued to it all day or chained to it and you couldn't leave it. Uh, the mass temperature would get 
or the hot liquor tank would get too cold or it would get too hot and you're constantly like dumping water, putting an ice cube or something, you know? Yeah. This is pretty like Hands foolproof. Off. Yeah, it's just, just kind of watch it do its thing. So, very, very cool.